It's time to take your seat in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Here's your host, Mike Vaccaro. Thank you, Chuck, and welcome, everybody. Mike Vaccaro here in the front row. As always, behind the scenes, it's J.R. Quitman, our creator, producer, and director. Coming up today on this episode, it's John Bunting, a former football player at North Carolina in the NFL, as well as the Eagles and the Philadelphia Stars of the USFL, and then a coach after that, both in the NFL and on the collegiate level at North Carolina. We talk about his sports journey, how it started, and what he's doing now down in nice and warm Naples, Florida, where he is currently retired. So that is all straight ahead. Today's sports journey provided by John Bunting in the front row. Enjoy our episode. Coach, first of all, thanks so much for, for spending some time with us. We, we, we greatly appreciate you, you doing that. And uh, you've got a great story that we're going to certainly get into here this afternoon. Um, and, and let's start with, you know, you're born in Portland, Maine, back in 1950. How long did you grow up in Maine? Because eventually you moved to, to just outside Washington, D.C. But do you remember your time in Maine? My dad and mom were born and raised there. Uh, I happen to be born on what I call vacation, uh, been on one ever since. Uh, my dad would study Russian at Middlebury College in the summers for four to six weeks. And so he would drop us off at my uncle and grandfather's built cabins uh, up in Raymond, Maine. And my mom would stay with us. A bunch of others would be there. We had probably Oh, three moms and about uh, eight kids running around every summer for about four to six weeks. And uh, I had a blast. My dad uh, joined N uh, NSA, National Security Agency, uh, where he was a analyst. And he, I guess he used some of that Russian training to uh, look after our country uh, for many, many, 35 years. So... Uh, I would go up there in the summers as a kid uh, when I started playing ball. Uh, we, we stopped going. Maybe we'd go up for a week. But uh, that was, uh, you know, it's, and it's now where I have uh, my vacation home. That's where I go in the summer. Uh, bought, I bought the same place that uh, my uncle and grandfather built. Uh, so it's, it's, it's Maine is a place I was born, but it was, I was raised in that Washington, D.C. area. Uh, Northern Virginia and Southern Maryland. Well, well, certainly, as you said, great ties to go back there and, and have that vacation home. And, and as you said, you start playing sports. And it seems like a lot of these interviews we do, kind of those that uh, are a little bit more mature that we talked to played a lot of sports, played every sport. And it seems like you were one of those guys as well. What were you playing at the time growing up? You know, I didn't play football until I was in uh, 10th grade. Um, there was no you know, junior league around my, my neighborhood. So we played neighborhood ball and stuff like that. And uh, usually I'd give my helmet to somebody else. That's probably why I'm a little goofy sometimes. But uh, I, I played basketball, I played baseball all my life. Loved both those sports. But football was something I just started watching on TV when I was a youngster and, and uh Loved that sport. Couldn't wait to play that sport. Jim Taylor, the Green Bay Packers fullback, was my favorite guy. Uh, it was, and of course, we didn't have a whole lot of uh, games on television back in the in the day. So, you know, I might we might get a Colts uh, broadcast down there in Southern Maryland. Occasionally, would get the Redskins. Now the football team, uh, and they were terrible. The Redskins were terrible. So I, I, but I still, I stuck with them. I loved them. And uh, so that football was something I always wanted to do. And I didn't get to play it until I was in 10th grade. And didn't play varsity until I was in 11th grade. And for you, I mean, obviously that, that took off. Uh, Silver Spring, Maryland area, you were all county, you were all met as well. Uh, did you, and you were doing that in all the sports, basketball, baseball, and football. But did you see yourself and in, in, in a future more so in football at that time? There is no doubt that, that I, th I took to football much, much more. Uh, and, and my baseball coach in high school, uh, at what do you think your scholarship is going to be worth at the University of North Carolina? I said, you know, forty, fifty thousand dollars 50000 And he goes, nobody's offering that kind of money and you can't hit the curveball. So uh, 
let's stick with UNC. So, you know, as much as I love baseball, uh, I was not a curveball hitter. 0-2, I'm swinging on the next pitch for sure. Uh, basketball is a lot of fun. I enjoyed that sport. Tr- terrific. Uh, and, and we had good teams. Uh, so we, we went places. We, we, we had a lot of fun playing sports. And, um, and my, my parents were extremely supportive of me playing sports. My older brother was a, was a, a kind of a mentor of mine. Uh, played football, uh, did track, was an outstanding wrestler. And little brother uh, actually uh, went to uh, college, Randolph-Macon, on a scholarship to uh, play basketball down uh, th- there. We went to his uh, D2 championship uh, up in, in Massachusetts. So we were sports-oriented family. Yeah, certainly. And again, uh, basketball, baseball, football, all those things. I mean, all county and, and all met. Uh, I mean, what did that mean to you at that time to to be honored uh, with those type of recognition that you got? Well, it, you know, it was an honor. But, you know, what I was always looking forward to was the next. What's next? Um, you know, I, I'm not saying that I dreamed of playing pro football, but I mean, that was something that I, you know, hoped I might be able to do uh, was, you know, 6'1", 190 pounds uh, in high school, which, you know, is not small, but it's not huge. Um, and when I went to North Carolina, I uh, anticipated uh, being a fullback uh, and a linebacker. And uh, I discovered early on at Carolina, fullback never carried the ball. All he did is block for Don McCauley, who was an All-American. And soon they switched me to center. And uh, so I was hiking the ball and I was playing linebacker and it, it, you know, linebacker became my, my position of choice and, and had a lot of good, good times playing that, that uh, position at UNC. And we got better and better, and better every year uh, in Chapel Hill. Yeah, there from 1969 to 1971, Bill Dooley again recruited you. Uh, tell us about him and, and what made him you know, a special coach, and I know someone that, uh, again, you revere even to this day. There's no doubt about that. And, uh, you know, coming down to Wilmington uh, area to to live after things went south at, in Chapel Hill, uh, he, he continued to be my mentor. And, and a number of other people, I, I, I joined the board of the Greater Wilmington Sports Hall of Fame, and I had so many great mentors on that board and too many to even discuss right now, but I could name some later. Uh, Bill Dooley was starting a football program and he had come out of the, you know, the Southeastern conference, Georgia coached with his brother, Vince, Uh, you know, that football, the Southeast conference at at that time was uh, built basically around speed and, uh, and weren't big players, uh, but, uh, very, very demanding uh, was what they did in spring ball and what they did in fall ball. And Bill Dooley was no different. And he brought that mentality uh, to uh, Chapel Hill. And uh, I would say that during the course of my four years, uh, we had probably 40 freshmen uh, that were on scholarship when we started. And by the end of uh, the time, uh, we probably had 12 players left. So people left the program, which is kind of what he was desired. Uh, he, you know, we're, we're, we're talking about talented players, but are you tough enough to play? And that's what our program was built around, was being physically, mentally, and emotionally tough. And Bill Dooley installed that in me. And it really helped me a great deal when I eventually became drafted uh, by the Philadelphia Eagles in the 10th round and went to training camp. Training camp was no, (laughs) it was easy compared to what we did with Bill Dooley in Chapel Hill. (laughs) Well, well, you survived and you strived really in that role because you were a defensive captain as a linebacker, as you said, eventually getting to that linebacker position. 1971, you were all ACC as well. And and you, you led the Tar Heels or helped lead the Tar Heels to the first outright ACC title as well. So, you know, what was it about you and your mentality? And was it your upbringing that, that helped you survive and strive in, the, in that time and the, the, you know, 
in the, in the way that he coached you guys? Well, you know, I, I learned what it was going to take to play ball, uh, to be part of the program. And be honest with you, uh, you know, I got married as a sophomore. I had a child. And, um, you know, not being in the dorm with the, the, the players who, you know, once again, they're young guys. And I don't think it's any different from back then to the way it is now. Uh, the, the, if, if you have a little bit of time on your hands, you want to have a lot of fun. I didn't have that uh, notoriety. I, I, I was home. I was taking care of a, a wife and a child. So I had to be very disciplined on in everything that I did. And my goal was not to be, uh, you know, a, a, a genius. My goal was to stay eligible. And that's what I did. Uh, and, uh, you know, all through college, went to class. That was demanded. If you didn't go to class, you were, you ran. I brought the same mentality when I took the job there. You, you, you had to go to class. And, 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 and I did and showed up and stayed eligible and graduated. And uh, so very proud of that fact. Uh, but being part of the program and seeing it get better and better each year. Uh, my junior year, Don McCauley was an All-American uh, and a tremendous athlete. Uh, we had a couple other players who were really, really good offense. Bill Dooley built an offensive line, and he built it around a running game. Uh, Paul Miller was our quarterback, terrific, terrific athlete, great human being, tremendous leader, uh, been extremely successful uh, business-wise since that time. And I think he would credit Bill Dooley a lot with the discipline that was installed in, in all of us. And I, I would say that, you know, being part of that 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 growth and seeing us, we, we lost uh, to Wake Forest uh, in the championship my junior year. And our goal, of course, next year, the next year was to, to win that championship. Uh, we lost uh, two ball games that year. We lost to uh, Notre Dame, and I can't even remember the, what the other loss was, but, uh, you know, we had a good football team. And uh, we, we went to the Gator Bowl, and we lost to, lost to Vince Dooley's Georgia. So um, great experiences, toughened me up, made me know what was important and what wasn't important, uh, you know, in, in, in terms of playing football at the highest level. And as you said, you got married, you had a child. So did your focus then become, okay, how can I make myself into a professional football player? Was was that on your mind at that time at all? It, it may have been on my mind, yes. Uh, but uh, I was not a, a, a weightlifter. I was not a, in, in probably the gray, greatest condition. Uh, and I had a guy named Mike Mansfield who was also a linebacker. He was an all uh, – state quarterback out of Virginia, all state wrestler out of Virginia. Uh, he challenged me uh, after I got drafted to get into the weight room, get into training. Uh, I went from a 225 pound bench press to, you know, 360 in a matter of, of months uh, because of his influence on me. Uh, but uh, and he, and he was he was a year behind me and uh, he had a tremendous impact on trying to get me ready to go up to the next level. Well, and again, as you said, you, you did get to the next level, drafted 10th round by the, the Eagles. Um, what was that transition like for you? As you said, you got toughened up playing for Bill Dooley, but still there had to be a transition going from the college level to the pro level, especially back in the 70s. Well, back in that time, uh, the professional football teams would take – at least 120 players to camp. Uh, and we would start in mini camp with probably that, that number. And then maybe it would, it would be cut down in some way. So when I went to Philadelphia, never been to Philadelphia in my life, even though I'd lived only two hours South in Washington, DC, um, you know, Eddie Kaya was the head football coach. Uh, there was probably about, 20 linebackers in mini camp and as we left mini camp I, I found myself uh, way back in the uh, uh, the depth chart uh, and and found myself trying to find a way to, to, to stay alive uh, in training camp and the big thing was to one stay healthy two 
be smart enough that when you did get your opportunity on the field, that you didn't make a lot of mistakes. And uh, that's what I think happened with me. I was uh, our starting middle linebacker and Bill Bradley, the free safety, held out of camp. Uh, and they got one got traded. Uh, Steve Zabel moved from outside to inside, moved me up a couple of notches. Adrian Young, who was a second round pick out of USC, uh, he was not in particular favor with the uh, the coaching staff. Uh, and he, matter of fact, and on uh, the, the bus ride to, to play Dallas uh, Cowboys on opening day, I'm, I'm playing all the special teams. Uh, Adrian Young is the starter. He told me, you watch out today. Uh, you, you see what, what goes on. You may be the, the starting backer before the day's over. And sure enough, the second half, I was inserted into play. And the next week, uh, Adrian Young was waived, and I became the starter. And it was pretty crazy. I started like three games. And after the fourth game, where I got beaten by, you know, running back after running back, I had no idea how to play man-to-man uh, -man coverage. And... Uh, and that's what we primarily did. And uh, I was benched and became a, became a part-time starter. Play all the special teams. It would enter the game, uh, you know, at halftime, something like that. So I, it, I really didn't become a full-time starter until my second year. Well, certainly, uh, you know, you had a great career there, 1972 to 1982. So that's, that's a long career for anybody in the NFL. And to do it for 10 years uh, is certainly great. Um, again, how did you survive that all that time? That, that's actually 11 years, 72 through 11 years, excuse 11. me. That's right. Uh, and, uh, I end, uh, ended after the, the, the 1982 player strike. I was the Dick Vermeil, uh, a tremendous coach, uh, probably the most impactful person that I've ever met in my life besides my own family, uh, had, uh, asked me to be the player rep. Uh, for the, the Eagles, and I did that for seven years. And, uh, you know, over the, the last two or three years before the 82 strike, we, we knew that something was going to happen, and uh, uh, and certainly it did. We, you know, we hold out for 57 days. Holy smokes, it was crazy. It was hard, and it was, you know, it, it took a lot out of our team, took a lot out of people's families, uh, but it, it was necessary. Um, I was fortunate to have some really good coaches. Uh, Walt Michaels was our defensive coordinator and linebacker coach, 73, four and five. Uh, he had played in the league. Uh, very, very physical guy. I, I can, to this day, I can, I can see his forearms. They were giant. They were Popeye. You know, he looked like Popeye. He was so pumped up. And, and you knew, uh, and, and he respected toughness you know if you got cut down on the field if you took the the, the player out he, he thought it was a good play <laughs> he was really really smart and really tough uh i i'm very respectful of what he he taught me and uh and what he did for our defense uh we were good but but not good enough uh we had a lot of trades in the 75 season lost a lot of our leadership uh and uh we we went downhill fast in that season and and consequently uh, uh mike mccormick our head coach was fired uh dick for was hired uh and it was once again a, a a regrouping of what you do as a player what you do as a defensive unit what you do as a special teams unit dick for brought that that mentality toughness hard 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 to play for the man because it was demanding. Uh, training camp, I'll tell you a quick story. We go to training camp on July 3rd, uh, 1976. Uh, it, it be, I can remember being in a meeting, uh, and we used to have to sometimes run from practice to dinner to get to meetings on time. But uh, we're in this first meeting with him. It's July 3rd. And there's fireworks going on outside. And Dick tells Carl Peterson, our general manager, who later became the president of the Chiefs, tells Carl, Carl, go outside and find out what's going on with all that racket going on. There's too much noise. The players can't concentrate. Carl comes back in and goes, Coach, it's fireworks. You know, 
the celebrating the bicentennial uh, a little bit early. He goes, what? Bicentennial? Yeah, the, the celebration of our country's birth, 200 years. Oh, okay, go get them quieted down. This is the thing that Dick brought, toughness, physical, uh, mental, emotional. You had to be totally committed to play for Dick Vermeil. Yeah, I mean, years later, you see kind of the more sentimental side of, of Dick Vermeil, but uh, the, the toughness there. And obviously it worked out because he helped lead you guys to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 15 in 1981. You're the NFC champs in that year. Unfortunately for you, you, you come up short, you lose to the Raiders in that Super Bowl, but still it had to be a, a fun ride to, to get to the Super Bowl and win that NFC championship. We had, a, once again, we built year after year after year of uh, 78 uh, I go down with a ACL reconstruction uh, up in Foxborough. Uh, the team has a winning record for the first time in like 20 years. Uh, they go to the, they go to the playoffs, lose to the Falcons. I come back off surgery, and I'm not even practicing uh, halfway through training camp because of the nature of the injury and the length of time it takes to rehab. Uh, and it would, was given like a 50-50 chance to ever play again. Uh, but I had a terrific trainer Ron O'Neill who uh, took me to the side uh, I was not even allowed to watch practice go to meetings I was on PUP physically unable to perform and uh, we were off to the side someplace working out all the time and finally last preseason game Vermeil comes to me and says we're going to activate you um, and we're going to have to cut a player uh, to, to activate you. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if, if you're ready. I said, of course I'm ready. Of course I'm ready. Well, I may have did, done this player a big favor. Uh, they activated me and they cut Bill Cower <laughs> out of NC State, who was yeah. a free agent and uh, ended up being picked up on waivers by Cleveland, Marty Schottenheimer, who they developed a relationship and we all know the rest of that story <laughs> so i played in that that miami dolphins last preseason game dick was not happy with the way i looked he, he he had no problem with the way i played he says you're limping around out there in between plays i'm calling the signals blah 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 and i said hey coach i'll be fine just just let it go so i started the season and uh, never looked back played all the games and uh we uh, had a winning season again, went down to uh, Tampa to lose to the Bucks, uh, who went on to play in the NFC Championship game against, I think, the Rams. Um, and uh, the next year, uh, we go further. And uh, we the goal was to get home field advantage, which we were able to do with the 12-4 and four record. Um, and, and Dallas had to travel to us. And I think everybody knows how much Philadelphia hates Dallas. Um, and I know how much I can't stand Dallas, even though Mike McCarthy, the head coach, is a buddy of mine. So uh, we brought them into Philly, and uh, we just smoked them. And it was a, a 21 to 7 ball game. It could have been 45 to 0. We, we, we shut them down so much. And uh, uh, it was like 21 below 0 uh, windshield. And um, – we made them wear their blue jerseys, which they hated to wear. So it was all in our favor. And, uh, you know, we had a great time. And then we went down to New Orleans and things didn't work out for us in, in that uh, Super Bowl. But uh, sure enough, when we beat the Tennessee Titans, when I'm coaching for Dick Vermeule as his co-defensive coordinator, that game ends. Dick and uh, Wilbur Montgomery, running backs coach, and Carl Hairston, defensive line coach, we all gather and we and we say to one another, "That's for the boys back in 1980." Uh, that's how much that football team meant to Dick Vermeil, and meant to me, and Wilbert, and and Carl. Yeah, I mean those those Philadelphia ties run deep and and hard to give up. Like you said, you still hate the Cowboys now. That's that's no great. doubt about it. <laughs> and you started Bill Cowher's coaching career, so uh... that, that is the truth. You know, he does, he kind of snubs me most of the time when I see him, and I haven't seen him in a long time because I'm very very happy uh, being retired down here in Southwest Florida. But uh, you know, I would see him at meetings and stuff like that. He kind of avoided me, but I got him started. 
I did. Marty loved Bill Cower, and of course, I had the great fortune uh, to coach out in Kansas City for Marty Schardenhammer. Uh, and God bless him. Uh, he died last year. Tremendous football coach, uh, and I think he sh- he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Fortunately for Dick Vermeil and the rest of us that played for him and, and coached with him, he's going in next year, and I'm looking forward to going to Canton uh, again. I was in Canton this past year with. Harold Carmichael's in, induction, one of my favorite people in the world. Yeah, some of the greats there from uh, the Philadelphia Eagles days. And as you mentioned, too, you were the, the player rep uh, for the Eagles. How did that come about? And you, I mean, you did it for six years. Was was it an enjoyable experience? Was it a difficult experience for you? It was an eye-opener. Um, Ed Garvey was the uh, executive director, very, very brilliant person uh, and um, tough, very tough. I was in – I was on the, the executive committee, so I was in big time uh, meetings and saw Ed. Uh, nobody could touch him. Uh, the management council could not even come close to matching his his brain and his willpower uh, to explain things. And uh, we had gone on strike in '74, and that was the uh, no freedom, no football. Uh, placards that we all carried around those signs and that was of course trying to get free agency and and you know at at the time when your contract expired uh you could do one of three things maybe get a new new contract for one two three four whatever years management would agree to or you could play for uh 80 percent of what you made last year or you could you know quit so it was it was tough going the 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 roselle rule was in force you could not go any place you only could go another place if you were traded or if you released and so becoming a player representative and trying to discover from 70 77 forward uh what which direction do we want to go when the new collector bargaining agreement would come up in 1982? And what we decided to do was to try to get 55% of the gross revenues put into a pool and have the players divvy it up based on years of service, position played, blah, blah, blah. Uh, So there would be never an incentive to get rid of a player because the pool would always be there. Now, a lot of, players objected to that. Some people said it was socialism, it was communist, blah, 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 because, you know, we were trying to get a percentage of the gross. Uh, That didn't fly very well, but we we went on strike after the second game, uh, and we're out 57 days. Uh, Coach Meal thought it'd be a great idea to, to introduce the defense when we came back, so yours truly is a fourth player trotting out on that field after the three D linemen are introduced and 70,000 people got on their feet and booed my butt. Wow. Uh, and that wasn't fun. I've only been starting for 10 years and, and they're booing me. Uh, but that season was a wreck. Uh, we lost some really close games. We only played nine games. Uh, and when the season was over, uh, three weeks later, yours truly is on the front page of the Philadelphia Inquirer. A bunting axed and I'm gone. So, you know, there's not much I can do. Fortunately for me, uh, Carl Peterson, uh, the, the old player personnel guy who I had fights with to try to get a new contract once or twice, uh, was the president uh, of the <coughs> Philadelphia Stars and um, asked me to come over and play. And I said, Sounds great. I mean, I picked up my equipment and walked a quarter of the way around the vet and, and put it in a, in a new locker room. And to be honest with you, you know, that was so much fun. Playing for Jim Mora, he had a great staff, and, and that staff went on to coach in the NFL for years, and some of them are still coaching in the league. But uh, Jim Mora was a terrific coach, a lot like a lot like a Coach for Meal. Um, very tough, very disciplined our football team was extremely disciplined and we had talent. I mean, we had, uh, 
you know, Kelvin Bryant, you know, another Tar Heel. Uh, and uh, the offensive line was terrific. Chuck Ficino was our quarterback out yep. of Penn State. Uh, we had receivers that were good enough to get open, and Chuck would get them the ball. Uh, not not the, the strongest arm, but very smart, uh, good on his feet. Our defense, you know, uh, who, who could who could think of a player like uh, our middle linebacker Sam Mills that was five nine. 235 pounds, 230 pounds, uh, the best best linebacker in the USFL. And I got to play alongside him. And then after two years at the age of 34, matter of fact, it was on my birthday, July 15th, 1984, we beat the uh, uh, Arizona Wranglers, coached by Georgia Allen, uh, down in Tampa, smashed them pretty good, uh, you know, drank champagne, and, and uh, the next week we, we flew across the ocean to uh, play at uh, the Tampa Bay Bandits in, a pre- in an exhibition game uh, coached by uh, Steve Spurrier. But uh, I retired and uh, coached the next year, coached my replacement, uh, and uh, who turned out, George Jamison, who turned out to be a really good player, played in the NFL, uh, and, and, and Sam Mills. So I had a great experience coaching. 85, of course, we won the championship again, and uh, and then the league dissolved. Yeah, USFL, as you said, you won it in 84 as the Philadelphia Stars, won it in 85 as the Baltimore <coughs> Stars. But, you know, it was a short-lived league, but, boy, it had an impact. As you said, some of the names there, you mentioned Sam Mills, you had Herschel Walker, you had Jim Kelly, you had Steve Young, you had the coaches a- as well. Was there any hesitation with the with the startup league for you to go there to, to Philadelphia to, to play for the Stars? It was a hey, I knew that nobody would pick me up. There was out of the you know thirty two teams, I'd say half of those player representatives were gone uh, in in the next by the next year when it rolled around. <clears throat> but I just it was an opportunity, and and it was an opportunity to stay in town at the time. Uh, I was separated, and I still had two children uh, in the Philadelphia area, and uh, was fortunate enough to, to coach uh, and and play in in the town that I had been in for you know 15 years. So I was thankful and grateful uh, that I was able to, to to be able to do that, and and to have so many wins. I mean, my last year as a, a Philadelphia Star, we went 19 and two. We lost two games. We lost to the Generals and Herschel Walker twice, but then beat them in the playoffs. Hey, amazing. Again, uh, the USFL short-lived, but uh, certainly a big impact. And, and obviously a big impact for you as you start your coaching career. You made that transition. Eventually went into college coaching as well, right? An assistant coach at Brown and then Glassboro State as an assistant. Eventually became the head coach. Was that a seamless transition for you to, to go from player to coach and eventually head coach? Um it became something that I, I wanted to at least try, experiment with. I mean, you know, coaching for the Stars was was easy. We're, the, the players were so good, uh, and the staff was <clears throat> extremely uh, talented. But when everything shook out and it was done, um, the opportunity to go up to Brown was a good one for me because of the uh, John Rosenberg was an old Philadelphia Stars coach. Uh, and I went up there, and to be honest with you, it was miserable. Uh, it was, we weren't very good. We had, on defense, we had game coordinators. And I found myself watching uh, these game coordinators sabotage the other guy's game plan. Mm-hmm. It was not fun at all. And I said, I'm done with coaching. This is kind of what I perceived it might be, although I had, you know, played for Dick Vermeil's staff and Jim Moore's staff. Those were all good. That was great, great experiences, <clears throat> but this was poor, and I wasn't sure exactly where I'm going with coaching. <clears throat> and sure enough, um, I, I, my my son was in a golf camp with the head coach at Glassboro State named Ted Ted Kirshner, and uh, he asked what I was doing. And, I, and at the time, I was I was getting ready to do Temple football radio broadcasts. Mm-hmm. Head coach of Temple, Bruce. 
Arians. <laughs> Is that crazy or what? Wow. Uh, so I did I did Temple football uh, and um, was an assistant <clears throat> coach for Glassboro, where I would coach the D line in practice all week and then go away to to do the Temple games and miss miss the games. And when the season was over, uh, I applied for the head coaching job at Pittsdown. Fortunately, I did not get that job, and but later got the, the Glassboro job. The, 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 the president of uh, Glassboro wanted a winning football program and had not won in like 20 years. Uh, they had m- mediocre uh, records, and uh, they wanted a full-time coach. So... I said, hey, I'm ready. They, they, they said, we're going to hire you as a full-time coach. You're not, going to, <clears throat> you're not going to teach. You're not going to coach another sport like every other coach in that Glassboro State University program. Uh, you, have to go to, you have to do one thing. You have to go to one meeting and be introduced by the PE uh, faculty rep so he can introduce who you are, what you're going to do, and that you're going to have these controlled uh, duties. You're not going to be a, a, a teacher. You're not going to be coaching in another sport. So I got introduced at this faculty meeting. As soon as the last words left the faculty rep's mouth, this girl jumps up and she says, in effect, I think this is a bunch of BS. You know, every one of us in here coaches another sport. Every one of us teaches summer school. Every one of us it, it teaches during the season. I walked back across to the field house with my one full-time coach who co- coached two sports, taught three classes. And I said to Casey Keeler, who's now the head coach of Sam Houston State, I said, Casey, who's that girl that jumped up? He goes, well, that's Dawn. You don't want to know her. Two years later, I asked her to marry me. <laughs> so, it's a pretty good story. She jumped <laughs> up and jumped all over that stuff, and she was right. But that's what they want. They want a full-time coach that was committed to recruiting and running the program and we went on to have terrific seasons we had a, a i think a mediocre seat for my first year but we built on that just like the programs i had been with with dick for we got better and better and better we got better players and we became very disciplined we had a terrific uh re- re- recruitment and retention and that's what it took so again head coach at glassboro state 1988 to 1992 and then you make the jump to the NFL as an assistant coach. So what, what was the, you know, the mindset there? Obviously you're going to a different level. You're going to the professional level, but you're, you're giving up being a head coach. So, so what was that like for you? Well, you know, once again, I, I admit Glassboro state was terrific for me. Uh, you know, I, I met my future wife. Um, we had a bunch of wins. Um, we went to the summer finals of the, of the NCAA division three tournament. Uh, lost to Washington Jefferson, the eventual winner of the D3 championship. And, you know, it was, I had been out to training camp with the Chiefs two years uh, and, and been out there for a week or two. Carl Peterson was the president of the Chiefs, uh, who was the former president of the Stars. <clears throat> and, you know, he invited me uh, to come out and I did, enjoyed it saw what pro coaching was about with Marty. Um, Dave Adolph was a defensive coordinator and also a linebacker coach. Uh, Very knowledgeable guy, friendly enough uh, to the point where uh, when the the, the 92 season was over, I was invited to come out and join the staff uh, as a defensive assistant. And, uh, you know, that was – that's the direction I wanted to go at that time. Uh, become an assistant coach, <clears throat> maybe, as, as Marty would later say to me, what's your goal? Do you want to become a defensive coordinator? Do you want to become a head coach in the NFL? What's your goal? And I told him, I said, my goal is to become the head football coach at the University of North Carolina. And Marty goes, hmm, it's a pretty cool place. I said, well, that's where I went to school. And when I left Chapel Hill, that's the one place I wanted to, to return to at, at some point. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know how, how I'm going to get there, but that's what I want. Anyway, I was able to coach for five years there at the Chiefs. 
Coach Vermarty was uh, was demanding, um, and uh, he was a, a, a coach that I think made a tremendous impact on me in that so organized and he was he could coach any position he could go on the he was a defensive guy by nature but he could coach offense defense special teams very very uh hands-on coach and i admired that uh and i said that's that's how i want to be if i ever ever become a head coach and fortunately for me <clears throat> dick Vermeil, been out for 17 years or whatever it is decides that he wants to get back in and he knows that the, the Rams staff from when he coached special teams at the Rams many moons ago uh, gets the job and says, I'd like you to be my linebacker coach. And um, I'm going to hire Bud Carson as the defensive coordinator. And I said, wow, well, I'm going to jump at that opportunity. There's one of the greatest defensive lines ever in the NFL. And I got that opportunity to coach for him. Uh, what a blessing it was. And Carl Hairston, who was defense alignment for us with the Eagles, was hired as the defense line coach. D uh, Carl and, and, and Bud got along like, like brothers. Uh, <laughs> Bud liked me for one reason. He liked my wife. He <laughs> thought she was a cool girl. And, and he, they were drinking buddies. <laughs> but uh, he was, he, I can't even say on, on camera what he called me, but uh, my name was F and JB. That's what it was. Uh, anytime there was something wrong, it, it, F and JB, get over here. What, what's wrong? He had this high pitched voice, brilliant man, and, and God, so much knowledge. Uh, I just got exposed to a, a, another side of, of defense and the different things that he did uh, to take away. Uh, offensive weapons, whether it be a wide receiver or a tight end, he he could take the best part of the of the offense away. Uh, that's the biggest thing I learned. He retired after that that first year, and, and Peter Junta, who was a secondary coach, and I became co coordinators, and uh, we developed a tremendous relationship. And uh, you know, three uh, two three years later, 1999 season, uh, I think we go 13 and three. Uh, we have the greatest show on turf with Mike Martz, but on de defense, we're number six in the NFL. We're number one in run defense, which is what I'm in charge of. So, uh, you know, all those draws that people run and screens that people run when they're behind, when they're behind, because we'd, we'd get up on people in the first quarter. We would, they had, they had a hard time moving the ball against our defense. We were really good. And we, fortunately for us, we, we, uh, we we have home field advantage. Uh, we beat uh, everyone and advance to Atlanta to play the Titans, who we had lost to, one of our three losses we lost in uh, Nashville. Uh, and we only had a week's time to get ready. So uh, players went down, coach staff stayed behind, flew in a private jet down to uh, get ready for the, the opening practice. And, <clears throat> and uh, we had a fantastic plan. Uh, we had a fantastic first half of offense, but we didn't score any points. It was like nine to six or something like that. And we had over almost 300 yards of total offense. In the next half, we don't move the ball, and we're on the field the whole game. And it comes down to the last play. And thank God for Mike Jones, number 52, made the tackle. My favorite, favorite words from a referee when he did the review of the play, he said, the receiver was short of the goal line. The game is over. Yes. <laughs> I was jumping up and down in the press box and hugging Mike Marks and blah, blah, blah. And uh, two days, the, the, the next day we flew back to St. Louis. We had a parade. Uh, the next day, Dick Vermeil resigned. Uh, the next day, Mike Marks was hired. The next day, Mike Marks and I had a conversation about co-coordinators. He said he didn't believe in co-coordinators. Mm -hmm. And the next day, I was fired. Oh, fired. We were, I was, we were number one in the NFL in run defense, and I was fired. Um, fortunately, I was, you know, uh, I was unemployed for about an hour, and I, I caught on with the uh, Saints. Jim, uh, Jim Hazlitt asked me to come down and coach the linebackers, and uh, I had a wonderful time down there, and things went well. 
in Chapel Hill, Frank Beamer had been, had agreed to become the head coach, the next head coach, and uh, then went home to uh, Blacksburg and decided against it. And I was called by Dick Bedore, the athletic director, and I, he flew down to uh, New Orleans. We had a meeting. Then me and Don flew up to Chapel Hill, had another meeting, and got hired at my dream job. Doesn't get any better than that, does it? I mean, that is just a whirlwind all the way around there. And uh, <laughs> I want to go back to the Super Bowl for a second because you had the greatest show on turf with Kurt Warner. The movie's coming out now uh, about his uh, his journey. But it's a defensive play that ends that Super Bowl. So as a defensive co defensive coordinator, you've got to be thrilled to, to see, you know, obviously to win the Super Bowl, but to see it end in that fashion as well has got to be icing on the cake. Well, Mike Jones was, you know, I had London Fletcher as a middle linebacker, second-year player. As a matter of fact, Fletcher was a free agent out of that big powerhouse football program, John Carroll, <laughs> D3, okay? And, uh, but he was, he's, he was the next Sam Mills. Everybody was always looking for the next one. I got him, and uh, I'll never forget him when I had him on the phone, <clears throat> and we're going to bring a couple middle linebackers in for uh, mini camp, he said, Coach Funny, if you if you bring me in, you'll never be able to cut me. That was his words. Uh, and sure enough, it, it was very, very true. Uh, a warrior as a football player. Very, And I think being around Mike Jones uh, that, that season, uh, I think he really got into the, the mental part of the game. Mike Jones was the best tackler I ever had, and there it is. I get a, I get a little emotional even looking at it right now. Uh, but he is, he did everything to become a, a great player, great tackler, and uh, and he was very very bright, and uh, it was a, a dream come true. Uh, but they isolated him on, with Kevin Dyson, the wide receiver, and they thought that, th that this was the plan that they had for this this type of situation because everybody does does these different things when you get on different parts of the field time on the clock this that and the other mike jones is the guy they were going to pick on well they picked the wrong guy he was just a great great open field tackler put him down you know two feet short of the goal line and you know those words the game is over i'm loving that stuff <laughs> That's good stuff right there. And uh, yeah, it's great. Uh, again, you put so much time in, so much effort. It, it's, you know, no wonder you get emotional seeing that scene and, you know, a pinnacle as far as your, your coaching career is concerned. And, and then, as you said, it, you know, whirlwind after that. And eventually you get to your alma mater, head coach of North Carolina, 2000 to 2006. Um, you know, what, what are you thinking at that point? Obviously, you know, everyone kind of wants to go back, I guess, and wants to leave their alma mater. Um, so to have that opportunity, how, how big of an opportunity was that that, as you said, Dick Bedore gave you that in, in back in 2000? Well, I was thrilled. You know, here's the here's the trophy. All right. Let's get it in here. You know, the, the, you know, it doesn't get much better than winning the uh, nice. NFL championship. Uh, but hope I don't break everything here. <laughs> um, but to the one job I wanted, and I had told Marty that, and I come up for the interview in, in Chapel Hill, and Rick Steinbacher, who was one of my very best uh, assistant coaches slash administrators, uh, he was in charge of, of football operations. He drove me to the airport, and I said, so what do you think? Do you, do you think I have a chance? He goes, oh, I think you have a great chance. He says, we only have one other guy to interview. And I said, <clears throat> really? Do you mind sharing that, who who it might be? He goes, Marty Schottenheimer. <laughs> <laughs> is, is that unbelievable? <laughs> Marty, Marty was interested in that job. And uh, they gave it to me. <clears throat> and uh, my wife and I were just thrilled. Uh, and when we took that job over, we knew how enormous it was. Um, and, you know, people ask, what do you? What did you like better, coaching in college or, or or the NFL? Well, the NFL was in my mind easy 
compared to uh, the head coaching job at a Division One program, particularly one like North Carolina. And uh, <sighs> recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. But we come out of the box. We're, we're playing uh, – at Oklahoma, the defending national champion, we agreed to play that game. My seniors jumped on the table. And then we play at Maryland, and we lose to the eventual ACC champion. And then then we're, uh, we go out and play Texas, Mac Brown's Texas. And then we're scheduled to play SMU. Maybe we can get a win. We're 0-3, and we're playing at home against SMU. 9-11 happens. They postpone the game. So now we're playing Florida State, number five in the country. We knock them off. Yeah, you saw there back and in just showed some highlights of that. Uh, I mean, our team was really good. We had receivers. We had a decent offensive line. Uh, we had a, a quarterback named Ronald Curry who had – I had told Ronald, one of the greatest athletes that ever played in high school, I had told him, I'm not going to let you suffer out there. If things don't go right, uh, you're not going to go out there and, and take all – the defeat by yourself. So after the third game, we're 0 3. Me and Gary Tranquil, who is by far one of the greatest offensive minds I've ever, ever been around, uh, he and I had a discussion and we decided that Darian Durant, who had come in and, and mop up duty at Oklahoma, had played a little bit at Maryland uh, and played a lot out of Texas, we're going to give him an opportunity. So I went to the two headed quarterback. Every two series, the quarterbacks would rotate in and out. I thought Ronald would have a problem with that. He didn't. It took a little pressure off. But And, and Darian Durant became a just an un unbelievable player, and I'm so fortunate that, that he played for us. Uh, and and he, could, he, could, he could run. He could throw. Uh, he could improvise. He could take plays that were going to get nothing and make something out of them. Uh, one of my favorite of, of all time, for sure. But uh, we, we went on to, to have a, a really good season. I had We had a defense that was the best in the ACC. I mean, I had two number one picks, you know, Ryan Sims and Julius Peppers. Uh, nine of those guys graduate, and nine of them went to some NFL camp. That's how good those players were. David Thornton was a fourth-round pick of the Colts. Uh, we had other guys who went to training camps. Uh, our safeties, our corners, uh, another a defensive lineman, good players. But guess what? They all graduated. And they're gone? I don't have much. Because when a coach is in danger of losing his job, which Torbich was for a couple of years, recruiting starts to, to dwindle. So our players were okay. They were good kids, but they weren't great players. Those great players all graduated. But I did have Darian Durant for three more years, uh, and 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 it was kind of like I see UNC right now. They're going to score every time. The defense is not playing good enough to keep keep them in the game. Occasionally they play well, but not good enough over sixty minutes. Uh, and Darian Durant carried us, and we we got we had to score. Tranquil and I we knew that, so. Fortunately for us, we had we had the Darian, and fortunately for us, uh, by two years later, we had some players that we had recruited that were tough and, and, and good enough to play, and we went back to a bowl game. Back to a bowl game. As you said, you beat Florida State. You beat Miami in 2004, so two top five wins there as well for you. You know, you played for Bill Dooley. Did you kind of keep him in mind in your, in your coaching style going back there and trying to, to build that program back up? There's no question that the things that I had learned from Bill Dooley uh, had an impact on how I wanted to run a college program. <clears throat> and, you know, and part of that was discipline. Um, you know, these, these 18, 19, 20 year old kids, th that's exactly what they are. And they all are getting recruited by everybody across the country. And you, the, the, I think the, the, uh, the explanation that we used to retain players was, hey, the, the best thing we can do for our team is freshman comes in, make them a sophomore, get them to be a sophomore. And I think that's very, very true in any program. And that's what we, we, we went on 
and that's how Bill Dooley did things. But we had to weave some players out. <clears throat> and that may have been even some of the players that you did recruit because you, you didn't recruit somebody that was mentally tough enough to, to play at that level, go to class, behave, do things right. And that's pretty much what I wanted to do with a college program. Just what I had done at Glassboro State, now Rowan University, get these kids to graduate, get them to graduate with some form of degree that could help them for the rest of their lives and be good human beings and have it, have an impact on society. Uh, that's, that's, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, and we, we had the, those big wins. The, Carolina's never had those types of wins in the past and haven't to this day, but they could. I think Mac Brown can do that, that kind of thing. They can, they can be a, a top five program. But um, I enjoyed that time. Uh, my wife and I worked extremely hard at that game at, at, at Chapel Hill and getting that program in. <clears throat> you know, three years after we left, there were nine players drafted that we had recruited uh, and tied with Texas and USC. Nine players drafted. They weren't first-round picks, but they were nine players drafted. So we, we developed – uh, a, a good process in recruiting and, and retention. Yeah, as you mentioned, I mean, you were released from the NFL as a player. You were fired or let go after the Super Bowl with the Rams, and, and then it ends at your alma mater. That had to be difficult. How, how, how difficult was that on you and your family as well? Because, again, as you said, this is the job you wanted. It's your alma mater. Unfortunately, you know, it, it comes to an end. You know, uh, we knew it would come to an end sometime. <clears throat> we just didn't know when. Um, and sure enough, in hindsight, there are probably a couple of things we could have done differently. Uh, but uh, we, we were fighting a battle after that defense graduated to get better players on the field. Uh, and, and, we, we, and we did get it, and we got better on defense in 04 and 05, and then 06. Uh, we, we did not have the, the – number one position uh, recruited well enough to play well enough on the field. And that's quarterback. And, you know, we threw, we threw too many interceptions and we had uh, too many uh, problems moving the football offensively. Gary Tranquil had retired uh, in 05 after uh, Matt Baker had been our quarterback and Matt Baker had a terrific year deserved better we deserved to go to a ball game and, and i don't believe that word very much deserved we just didn't we didn't earn it, the right uh and we had so many freaking close games and uh the the, the then we got we, we we did not solve the quarterback issue uh and we had problems moving the ball and it, it became evident uh that that things were going south and uh and i'm you know thankful that we were able to finish the season. You know, I got fired with five games left, um, and but asked to hang on. And I totally respect that decision by Dick Bedore uh, after, you know, telling me that he and the president, if, if they don't fire me, they're gonna get fired. So it was a weird deal. And, and I had to be man enough to handle it. And fortunately for myself, my wife's very, very strong. <clears throat> we knew that we would survive. And all I wanted to do was once again, do right by our players, do right by my university and play, play the hand that we're dealt with and do the very best that we can. And, you know, we, we beat NC State again. We beat Duke again. That was, to, to me, that was great. I had the opportunity to play those guys. And we went up to Notre Dame, and we gave them all they wanted. I mean, we, we played so well up there. Almost beat, almost took Notre Dame down. And I think they're like number 10 or 12 in the country at that time. So we enjoyed the end uh, as much as we enjoyed the beginning because we were able to, to come out on top. Fans came on the field at NC, when we beat NC State at home. 
and and the fans were on the field uh, again. We didn't have any fans over at Duke, but you know to, to have them chanting at the end the fifteen thousand fans that were there. You know, thank you, John. Thank you, John. Uh, pretty special. Pretty special. Me and my wife got to uh, hear that chant. Yeah, it's certainly different. And, and when you're the head coach of your alma mater, as you were, and, and, and certainly the way you dealt with the ending is is tremendous. And and maybe if it's a different university, you don't do that, but it's your alma mater, and, and you handled it certainly with a lot of class. You know, after that, you, you retired. You, you moved down to, you know, just outside the Wilmington, North Carolina area. And, and as you said, got involved with the, the greater – uh, Wilmington Sports Hall of Fame, and you were an inductee as well uh, in 2016 after, you know, 13 years as a player in the NFL and in the USFL, an assistant coach, and then a head coach in college as well. What what did that honor mean to you to, to be inducted, be recognized for all that you had accomplished in, in your career? Ten years we spent uh, in Hampstead, North Carolina, just north of Wilmington, <clears throat> and we thoroughly enjoyed our time there, and, and we thought that we had built our destination home up there on the intercoastal waterway and a world-class marina. Um, but uh, the, the weather was something that started to bother me. I mean, uh, we're, we have a cabin in Maine that we go to every summer. Uh, we wanted to enjoy that time up there. Um, and we have friends and family that come up every year. Uh, and once you're there, you, you, you wanna keep coming back. But when the football season's over, I want to go outside. And in Wilmington, it was just too cold for me to get inducted into that group. You know, the Roman Gabriels, the Sonny Jurgensons, the people that I got associated with, uh, Joe Robinson, uh, you know, some other coaches that were on that board, uh, male and female, they, they had great impact on me and, and, and my life and my family. Um, so to get inducted there into the Greater Wilmington Sports Hall, it was a tremendous honor. My dad was present at that. And uh, at that time, he was probably about 96, 95 years old. Uh, he lived to be 100. I'd moved mom and dad down. That was one of the things I, that I decided I was going to do uh, in 07. Uh, I'm, I was going to continue to do radio TV. Uh, I was going to mentor uh, players uh, down in, in, uh, at IMG in Bradenton, Florida. Uh, I had Luke Keekley, I had Manti Teo. <clears throat> and during that January and February months, seven, eight weeks down there, it's 75 degrees, you know? And I'm saying, January and February, 75 degrees in Florida? Holy smokes. I had never wanted to be in Florida, but we started to look and we started to uh, take six weeks, eight weeks and go to, in January and February, go down to uh, Southwest Florida, Fort Myers Beach. So we found ourselves loving that weather. I'm not a beach person, but I love going outside in the pool. I love walking my dog in the heat, blah, blah, blah. We start looking and uh, we finally, we, we found our, our spot uh, we're now in a, uh, a golf course community down here in, in Naples, Florida. Uh, the wife's out playing golf right now. I played yesterday, <clears throat> and I'll play again tomorrow. Um, so we alternate playing so which one of us can watch the dog. But it it, it became a, a the next and final destination. We, we, we cut down the size. We finally sold our home uh, up there in Hampstead. And we got a smaller place and, you know, we get, we're outdoors all the time. Uh, she's a pickleball player. Uh, I'm not, I'm not athletic enough or healthy enough to play that sport. I'll, I'll rip an Achilles or something like that. <laughs> Golf is just good enough for me. Uh, and so we're enjoying life down here in the winter. Uh, and we got our place in Maine in the summer. Well, that is great. You're you're living the best of your life right now, Coach. And and you uh, you again, bet. you've you've had an incredible sports journey. I, I greatly appreciate you, you know, sharing that with us. Just uh, incredible from uh, again starting off in Maine and and all the way through your coaching career and your, your playing career as well. Just uh, a lot of great stops, a lot of great names as well. And and again, uh, 
Bill Cowher. He's in the Hall of Fame because of you, Coach. <laughs> That's what I get out of this interview right there. He's in the Hall of Fame because of you. <laughs> There's some truth to that. There it actually is. He never would have met Marty. There you go. There you go. Well, Coach, again, we appreciate you joining us here in the front row. I uh, uh, hope you enjoy your time down south. Enjoy uh, the holidays as well with you and your family. Hey, God bless Wilmington. I had a great time there, and I'll be back to visit time to time. All right. Thanks, Mike. Well, my thanks to John Bunning for joining us here today. John Smith for helping connect us with him as well to be our guest in the front row. Great stories there. Great stuff, especially about Bill Cower. Hall of Fame coach, partly because of John Bunting. Our thanks as well to the YouTube channel, Coach John Bunting, NFL Films as well, for some of the footage you saw uh, in today's episode as well. For JR Quitman, I'm Mike Vaccaro. We appreciate you joining us uh, here for this episode all year long for all our episodes. If you like what you see, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We'll have another great episode shortly. Stay with us to see who it's going to be, who our next guest is, and learn about their sports journey. All that next episode coming up soon in the front row with Mike Vaccaro. Have a great day, everybody.